Welcome to the first episode of Nightcap Chat, the pop culture comics and gaming podcast. Today we talk about Star Wars Celebration, the episode 9 trailer, the Mandalorian footage, and variant comics in the comic book industry. I'm Blade O'Neill, and today I'm joined by Ken Brown, owner of Drawn to Comics. Thank you for having me, Blade. Yeah, it's an honor to be part of this. And uh, when you asked me to do this, I'm going, yeah, dude, I'm all on board. This is great. Yeah, uh, Nightcap Chat originally was a Twitch talk show. Um, but Ken and I worked together on an old little project we called Comic Fan Network. So we kind of combined everything and rebooted this into a little podcast. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about ourselves first here. Um, so Ken, if you want to maybe introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what kind of things you like. Yeah, my name's Ken Brown. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona here. I'm an Arizona native, second generation, which is kind of rare in these parts from what I understand. But uh, it's fun watching the valley grow over the years and comic books and movies and music and video games have all been part of that growth process. It's been fun to grow up a child of the 80s. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, 1984, the black suit Spider-Man got me hooked into comics. Yeah. And uh, shortly afterwards, too, I even got more into sports, too, and decided to uh, pursue a career in journalism. Okay. And that's what got me so excited working with Blade on this, too, is like, that journalism itch gets to be scratched here yeah and it's uh just kept on rolling and rolling and rolling until eventually i opened my own comic shop after helping other businesses learn how to help them succeed and build their business i didn't realize i was teaching myself on the side how to run my own business and in 2005 we opened up the comic shop called drawn to comics and it's a uh, now 2019 believe it or not i can't believe 14 wow. years have flown by that fast but yeah. we're still running strong and our community keeps us there and the love of comics and the love of community hopefully will keep us here for many more years to come and if any of you guys who live in the phoenix area listening to this if you have not been to drawn a comic you definitely go down and check it out um you know i i was hooked the first time i went down there like uh, i'm a transplant from new york and you know, I, I missed having a comic shop that, you know, remembered me when I walked in, you know, and just that that level of service and, you know, appreciating your customers. I mean, like that, I, I felt it was unrivaled, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm Blade. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, the kind of the brain behind Nightcap Chat. Uh, I'm a producer and voice actor currently producing for Woodcheck Creative. Um, you know, we do a lot of advertising, so I work on ads and, you know, I'm kind of always... Um, scratching that creative itch, if you will. Uh, and as a voice actor, um, I've recently been in a couple of uh, Steam games, one of them called The Reversion, a uh, chapter three. I play uh, Sergio's bodyguard, so it's the, it's the bad guy's bodyguard. Um, and I'm in another little game called uh, Winds of Change. Uh, I don't know if I can actually talk about um, who I play. I'm, I think it's actually a secret, so I, I'm, I just won't divulge any further than that I am in that game. A uh, small part, but I, I am in that. Uh, as well as some various commercials and whatnot. Um, but we've got some we've got some cool stuff coming out. Uh, we are working on a little short film. Um, but I, I wanted to have a little little podcast again where we talk about, you know, what we all love, you know, pop culture, comics, Star Wars, and and all that fun stuff. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing, amazing hobby right now. It's like it's been subculture now into four culture. Yeah. That's the biggest change I've seen in the past 20 years. It's the years. coolest thing right now is to be all about comic books, you it's know? It's insane. It's awesome. So memory four is like that. Yeah, you had a few friends. Now every friend wants to talk about what's going on in comic books or in movies or in video games. It's like really become just the major part of culture. And it's yeah. awesome to see. Uh, I, I was a Deadpool fan since the 90s. And, yes. you know, back then, like, you'd have to be in a comics to really know who Deadpool was. Like, there were, there were no Deadpool merchandise. Like, there was, like, maybe they did those couple action figures in, like, 92, 90. Yes, the X Force figure. Yeah, there was no shirts, you know. Yes. So, like, being a Deadpool fan, like, I, I didn't have merchandise, and like, generally, the general person did not know Deadpool. And now, Deadpool is like as popular as Spider Man. Oh, it's insane! You know? Yeah, I mean, you see Deadpool cups everywhere, Deadpool posters, Deadpool keychains. And you I, can't get away from Deadpool. And now. I was on pace to have every Deadpool comic right up until it was right around the time of you know when Ryan Reynolds first played him in the Wolverine Origins movie. And then they they ruined it with um, I think the beginning of the end for me was uh, Deadpool variant month. Do you oh, remember yes. that? Oh my gosh, dude! They did like fourteen times. <laughs> yeah. It was like over and over again. The first one was like Deadpool was on every cover, and it was kind of that was that first one when they were trolling older covers, like where he invaded he previous classic covers, or was that just? One of the later incarnations. It might have been did. a later incarnation, um, but that's not to say they hadn't done that before. Because even the Joe Kelly run had that classic um, Amazing Fantasy oh, fifteen yes. pose where he was holding yeah, Deadpool um, number eleven, wasn't that? I, I that sounds right, but I mean, it was that it was that classic, you know, 
you know, Spider-Man pose. Yes, and um, the interiors on that. Remember the interior story on that too? It was like Deadpool got stuck in a Spider-Man 60s comic. Was that what it was? Yes, it cracked gosh, me up I don't with remember. that. Yes, and Blind Al was playing Aunt May. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> gosh! Classic. Oh my gosh! That's so he right. kept on calling Aunt May Blind Al because he didn't know that it wasn't Blind Al. I've got to go back and reread it, that. It cracks me up. Aunt May, so why do you keep on calling me that, Peter? And he was in the role of Peter Parker in that comic. Oh my gosh! It cracks. I me totally up. forgot about that. I just remember. I remember the cover because shortly after, I think they did a GI Joe cover. Yes, dude. That you was know. I think number forty-two. Oh yeah, it was it was later in the series. With he spraying the, yes, the, yep. the, the the bugs yep. or whatever with the yep. bug spray. Yep. All like, of Deadpool, American Zero. I think it said yes. Um, well, that kind of brings us to like one of the first topics you want to talk about is is variant covers in yes. the industry. Uh, I was in your shop the other day. I was picking up uh, some of the new Star Wars: Age of the Republic. The the Grand Moff Tarkin book came out, and the variant. And I'm like. Man, just as a Four as a options. collector, there were so many variant <laughs> covers, know. and like I, you know, I love Star Wars, and I that's like the only that's the main Marvel stuff I collect right now, and it was just kind of frustrating. So I mean, like as as a shop owner, I mean, like like how do you feel about like all these variants that are yes. that have been coming out? I mean, I I do like I've heard both sides of the stories like that. The industry thinks of it as they like to offer options to collectors. I understand that, and, which is cool. But like that, for instance, Detective Comics 1000 just came out two weeks yep, ago, too. Yep. And there was 13 standard covers wow. that I had to order. And it was all nine ninety nine a piece cover price. Wow. So we're paying, I think the lowest price you can pay as a comic book retailer, if you have the deepest discount, would be about $4 per book. Okay. And so if you want one of every cover, you as a store owner are already out what is that? $42 yeah. just to get one of every cover mm-hmm. that's available for your customer. Yep. And then they're paying $130 maximum that's plus insane. tax. You know, some stores give discounts like we do do discounts in our store too mm-hmm. as well. But the majority of comic shops don't do that. So you're asking your customer if they want one of every cover, the only book they're getting that week is detective comics. They're out 130 bucks. Wow. I mean, like- and that's to me kind of like, that's a, that, that's a pretty bitter pill to swallow yeah. as a consumer walking into a comic shop excited about Detective Comics 1000. Because mm-hmm. one thing right now is like the, the comic industry's got huge benefit of the amount of press mm-hmm. that it's easy to get out there. Yeah. Whether it's through social media, whether it's through the DC channel, the DC app that's out there now yeah. too as well. They do like a daily show. Like what's it called? Like the DC Minute or whatever it is, or like where they do something I going more, on. More Marvel, but okay. I, I think Marvel does something similar yeah. too. Uh, and it's just they talk about everything they're doing daily. It's yeah. almost like CNN for comics. It's a good idea though, and it's cool. But at the same time, they're hyping all of that up. Someone yeah. going in like, dude, Detective Comics one thousand be part of that history. Yeah. First of all, like when they go there, they see thirteen different options for them to pick up, and then they're kind of going, "Well, shoot, dude, that's cool. Which one do I want the most?" Or the person that feels like, oh, man, I'm getting in. I'm going to buy all these. It's my first time walking a comic shop. I'm part of history. But then, you know, 10 years from now, that book's still worth $9.99 a piece. You know, you you're hoping that you may have something of a nest egg on it. But odds are there's probably no nest egg in it. And you would have been fine just getting your favorite cover Mm -hmm. out of there and been just as well off. Yeah. I mean, uh, most of the time that's not going to pay off, you know, when you're like, Oh, you know, this number one, you know, I'm going to invest in it. I mean, as far as modern comics go, I think as far as nest egg issues, besides, uh, the first, um, I don't know. It's this Gwenpool still worth anything. The first appearance of Gwenpool. I think I picked that up. Uh, uh the, the Deadpool that, that ironically, that was a variant, her first appearance yeah. on the cover of that Deadpool secret, secret wars. Number two, Gwen so, month. Because I speak to those different covers, they were all Gwen covers that month. I think one of the other ones, um, and they did the Gwenpool was like just more or less. It was you know, silly. Gwen Stacy dressed in a Deadpool looking outfit that was pink, and she was sitting by the pool. I, yeah, <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of going, "What the heck is that?" It became a character. That, that character <laughs> is is so silly, and in, in my opinion, just as, yeah, as a as an older Deadpool fan, like I just like the parody stuff. Like it just drives me nuts. Like it just seems like it's so much, but I I understand. Like, and I feel like you know it's absolutely fine. Um, but one of the one of the bigger, I guess, relatively recent payoffs, even though they recently rebooted again, was the new Fifty Two Batman. Yes, like that that skyrocketed, and even more so the Ethan Van Skyver variant that yes. that Erica picked that up. Um, I mean, it's a great cover, um, but that that's one of the times that 
of did variants pay did pay off. You know, yeah, there's a few different things that went on in that book too. It was like Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's first time working together on Batman, yeah, dream which, team. yeah, has a dream team appeal to it. Yeah, and they also introduced a probably one of the most popular new villain sets in Batman history in the past forty years. The Court of Owls, right? Owls. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And so I feel like those two elements, plus being the number one, I kind of say there's a power of three when it comes to collecting comics. Interesting. If you have three different types of collectors looking for the same book, you got a natural value there to it. Interesting. And so you have the first appearance of the Court of Owls, mm-hmm. you have a number one, and then you have Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's first time working yeah. together, which was an all-star team, as you said. It said. was a great run. And it's like, you know, it's potentially, that's got a longer term whether it's a variant or a regular book, don't mm-hmm. always mean something. It went five printings too, as well. It did. Yes. It did. It was. It was crazy. And even as a as a Marvel fan, like I, I most of our collection is Marvel comics. Like we even went out and, and bought that. Like that was one of the few few new ugh, few new fifty two. Say that five times fast. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that we uh, that we had picked up and something you know we we kept up with for a little bit. Um, but I mean that was that was some good stuff. But I mean, but now like I'm trying to collect these. Uh, these new Star Wars ones, there were there was four off the bat, you know? It's insane. I mean, I won't say insane. I apologize for the people that love variants, but not everything needs variants. I agree. I think uh, variants absolutely have a time and a place because sometimes it's exciting to like, yes. wow, you know, um, you know, this this artist came in and did a variant cover for this, you know? Um yeah, you know, like, oh, what's his name? He's been he was doing a lot of them, and he had like another term variants are super popular. Yeah, right or um, there was one where they did the the D Pooley variant. It was um, that, it was like a thousand dollar variant cover. Oh, the uh, like the J Scott Campbell. J Scott Campbell. That's exactly yes. what I was thinking. I was like, that's another issue. Like, I'm probably never gonna have the opportunity to to yeah. get at a and reasonable that was price. Too. Did you hear about how that whole thing was meant to be? No, I don't okay, think so. That was Marvel's answer to DC and the Blackest Night crossovers if I remember correctly. Was it? And what they more or less did was they mentioned like that if you rip off the covers of the DC Blackest Night books that you didn't sell and send them to Marvel, I think it was 25 of them, they would send you one copy of that J. Scott Campbell Deadpool variant. And I think it was the Wolverine with them taking the mask off and it was Deadpool or something like that, right? Wasn't that one of those covers? Yes, yes, because he, uh, yes. And they did the Mm -hmm. same thing for, I want to say their own covers for fear itself okay and did you do it did you rip I, comics dude, i couldn't it was like it was it you was didn't too, get any in it was blasphemy in my <laughs> you know it's like going, marvel's telling me to destroy dc product just to give them you know this send them to them and this option i said first of all two things are going on there is like that you're more or less blatantly saying that this dc comic sucks because mm-hmm. you over ordered it And second of all, you're kind of man, dude, it's almost you're helping out DC in a way, too, because you're making their book more collectible because you're destroying a percentage of the population. That's actually true. Supply and demand. Yes. And so it's interesting kind of twist. I didn't know how to feel on it because I'm kind of going, gee, dude, do I want to be known as the comic shop owner that was destroying books just to make money off of another book? And maybe that's a good idea to do. But I kind of said, I don't know if I want to go down that route. Have they done that since then? That they've only done it twice. Okay. Yeah, and I think maybe both times it just wasn't as well received as they hoped. But now those variants that did get out, yeah. they're like super, super scarce yep. and super valuable. It's, it's a it's a big hole in my collection. Like I, yeah, one like is I, like the one is like Eminem cover with yep. the Deadpool, with the two yep. girls around him. And the other yep. one was Wolverine taking off his mask and it was Deadpool underneath or something. like Yeah, that. I, th- I think he might have still like claws. I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're mm-hmm. talking about. Like, yeah, that's, you know, J. Scott Campbell's a great artist, but like that just it, it just made me so bitter. No, yes. Nothing against him, but just like, man, like I'm never going to get these these missing parts of my collection. Now, there is a know? more affordable way of doing it. When they did the second Prince of Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, mm-hmm. uh, that first miniseries, the second printings, they reprinted those covers with black and white. That's right. Covers. You know, I think I, I think I do have that one. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's, a, you know, the art you can have in your collection if you want. It's just not the full color. Yeah, great. I was just yeah. I was just going for like completionist on Deadpool. And oh now like gosh, it's dude. now it's like impossible. Yeah, and it's you know. insane too. Like some of these variants, like that man, they're I think that variant's about a five thousand dollar variant now. Like when it, people it shot to up sell that much, man. So and, I sh- I should have picked it up when it was only a grand. <laughs> yeah, and it's insane. It's like certain things right now. It's like this market is so influenced by um, propaganda. 
yeah. right now is like that. Oh my gosh, this book is so hard to find. You just gotta, it's almost like they're becoming golden eggs or yeah. like the, you know, the crystal skull from mm-hmm. Indiana Jones. Now mm-hmm. some of these books, like there is a Spider-Man book that's like covered by Del Otto. And there's people that are chasing the variants over the years to try to stockpile them. Yeah. And one sold for $14,995 on eBay. Oh my and, and I think it's because people are trying to stockpile whatever volume uh-huh. of these variants that are out there. And they were paying a thousand to two thousand dollars to collectors just to try to hoard the 100 to 500 copies that were out there. And it was a one in a hundred initially. Um, amazing Spider-Man book when it first came out. And then during this era of low print runs, supposedly there's a lot of theory that there's print runs of under 500 copies of some of these. Variants. Really? And so people are trying to hoard like that. It's few people's possible controlling the whole market mm-hmm. on certain variants. Yeah. And that's kind of an interesting. I don't know if that theory is true or not, but there is some, if you look really closely inside some of the CGC forums, you'll see certain collectors trying to say, hey, if you have this book, contact me, I'll buy it from you. Interesting. And so there's some, you know, some credence to that theory out there. Okay. I, I, I totally buy that. I, yeah, I, w- I would definitely believe that. Almost like heartbeat. Freemason Society of Commerce. <laughs> Go, what is happening here? The, the variants. This is your secret variant society. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I will control this market. <laughs> yeah. It's just, as a collector now, look, when, when a book is released and there's four variants off the bat, like it, it really makes you determine like okay am i getting all of this of this particular run or not yeah you know? well it's even harder now too because some of the other bigger books like once again the detective 1000 dc and marvel offer more or less programs for if you want to purchase 2500 copies you can get your own cover for your store oh and then that's something too is like that you have to start off with that 2500 number but then you can add on yeah from that number and people are doing like okay that's the 2500 copy one but then let me also add on another 500 that's without a logo on it and i'm going to call that the virgin variant that's harder to find interesting and then another one that's got maybe a black and white edition that's 750 to a thousand copies and so next thing you know is like this print run dc is getting an extra order for 5,000 copies Mm. or 4,000 5,000 copies of that book that they love Mm -hmm. but then those people put on the market is like oh this is a super rare unknown comics edition for example they're like a big one in the marketplace that does it a lot yeah. and it's just like okay this book right here 30 bucks right off the bat this one that's here's the more rare ones 50 dollars. then this one right here if you want the three of them together you get the full set for 100 bucks mm-hmm. and it's kind of going like people are all of a sudden spending another 100 dollars on this premium variant that may be sold out even j scott campbell himself on his website I mean, it's kind of, I was trying to, okay, when there was just two to three covers, Mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, that's kind of fun. Let me try to complete those. But on Spider-Man 800, he did eight different covers that you had as an option. And they were either like, you get the full set for 250 bucks or you can get them in groups of like Mm -hmm. three, three, you know what I mean? And two. I saw Greg Corn do something similar. I think, what was it? When the, when Bruce Wayne was getting married, I think it was, I think he had some of his own, he had some of his own uh, variant covers that. You had to get through Greg Horn. I Website believe it was. too. And it's like these artists are finding their own revenue streams besides Which, just I mean, the I guess, commission. I guess good for them. Yeah. I, as long, for something like that, like as long as it's not too common, like if, if it's a key event, like like Batman getting married. Or, yes. You know, like I, I, I'm okay with that and I'm, I'm willing to accept that. But I mean, if it's if there's four variants for every single issue, I mean, like, like where do you draw the line, you know, exactly. as a collector? You know, it's and it's just, you know, it's up to each individual person on – you know, personal budgets and collection wants and you know. yes and that's the thing too is like that that's where it's the hardest thing on comic shop owners is they need to make sure those numbers are super strict yeah. because they're whether the consumer buys it or not if it's in your shop you paid for it yep and then do you keep it do you know what i mean do you keep it valuable do you try to clear it out after a certain amount of time like the thing that i've always tried to keep a main level on comic collecting is you don't want the comic market to ever feel like it's not worth what you paid for it yeah and it's like, too, every other type of retail model is you go through like a clearance cycle. In comics, you really don't want to do that because it's like a collectible. Mm-hmm. You know, imagine, too, like in the coin shops and or inside of like, you know, stamp or baseball card shops. Mm-hmm. They don't they try to do the same type of thing as like they don't want their 
items to become clearance items. Yeah. They want them to become collectible items. Yep. And after they're off the market, they're worth more, not less. Mm-hmm. And comics are really in a dangerous spot right now. If there's more collectors than readers, you have to guess what the collectors want. If they don't want it, you're, you got to find a way to make that recoup that money back. Yeah. And that's what's unfortunately started happening is a lot of dollar bins have started in comic shops. Mm-hmm as a normal thing around the country. Yeah, absolutely. If you go back 15 years, there's very few dollar bin rooms in any comic shop around the country. And now in the past 15, you know, 10, 15 years, you're seeing like every shop have like a dollar bin section. And is that a good message to the long-term collector side of it? The reader, they don't care. They're happy with it. Yeah. But the collector side of it, the someone that sees this as like, Hey, is this something I want to kind of put my money in? You don't want them to see that in your shop. Yeah, I, mean, I would argue a more educated collector would understand that there's just comics that are invaluable. That's you know, true. Like, look, X Force number one, like that. Mm-hmm. Those are in dollar bins, you know, all day long until they announced uh, an X Force movie that'll probably now, yeah, they'll be like you know, 50 never bucks. happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I X Force number one was something like I just always bought every time I found it because I, you know, got cable. Yeah. You know, I loved all the X Force stuff. And remember, they were shrink wrapped with different cards. Yep, I, I've got and I've got a few different ones of those too. <laughs> yeah, you know, so there was the Deadpool card. Mm-hmm. There was the X Force card. There was the Cable card. Okay. If there was a Deadpool card, I might have that. I have to I have to go through. I don't. I don't even know how many copies of X Force number one I have. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think dollar dollar bin or even two dollar bins or whatever. Like it's. It's fun in adventure because you know every once in a while there's a gem in there. That's you true. Know, that That's has no business dig. being in there. Yes. And if you you know have um, you know any kind of foresight, you know maybe you know what dollar bin comics t- you to know, pick up. Yeah, exactly. That's, That's always kind fun. of the fun of the day. Again, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thing. It's like uh, American point. Pickers. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, what's, oh my gosh, right here. That's, uh, do you know, Secret Wars number eight? How'd that get in there? Shh, put the Secret I Wars wish. one through 12 all in there. <laughs> right, dude, here. Right. If you can share, what's, what in your, in your recent memory is your, your best dollar bin fine? Oh my can gosh. Can you remember? Dude. I remember I've done a few inside the store, like that, where I put out really? stuff without actually, you know, it's like, okay, you know what? This is all 90s comics. I'm going to put it out there. I got to go pick up Calyx. Remember, someone brought in a collection uh-huh. that one day. And, oh, I think I know what you're about to say. And there was, you know, 90s comics. I went through a little bit of it. They weren't any kind of order. And I said, you know oh. what? I'm sure the guy cherry picked the best stuff out of there. And I just put it all out in the dollar bins. And I came back and people were like, there, dude, I got a New Mutants 98. Dude, I got an Uncanny X-Men 266. Unbelievable. I got a Spider-Man 361. And if to let you guys all know what that is, New Mutants 98 is obviously the first appearance of Deadpool. Uncanny X-Men 266 is the first appearance of Gambit. And then Spider-Man 361 was first appearance of carnage and all those were a buck a piece and even better on it is this guy was in the military so how you could tell is there were mark jeweler variant copies mm, too so not mm-hmm. only did you get those key first appearances they were mark jeweler variants too which was wow. freaking awesome for yeah. the people that got them yeah and i'm kind of going oh my gosh this is insane that's so, cool you know i let everybody have their picks and then afterwards whatever was left over i'm kind of going okay let me see if there's anything left here. That's something that the store could actually use. There you and go. Very cool. It's, it's an awesome thing. It's a great reward. I remember another time too, is that, uh, you know, a collection came through and I thought I kind of just picked out, you know, the stuff that I thought the store could use. Mm-hmm. And a guy came up to me and he goes, did you know this book was in there? And I'm going, Oh um, no, but it's in there. You get to buy it for a buck. And it was X-Men 141 days of future past. Nice. And that was kind of, he goes, are you sure you don't want to charge me more? And I go, no dude, it was in there. That's my bad. No, you know, bad. yeah, you're right. And, and but, to me but that was respectful. Story. That was respectful for that guy of even asking. Yes. And that's awesome. That he even asked. And he still to this day, goes, yeah, cancel me an X-Men 141 for a buck. And I'm going, dude, that's an awesome urban legend story. Do you know <laughs> that to me is like something that is, to me, awesome because I would want to be in those shoes too. Yeah, and I'm not going to take it away from them just because yeah. it's like a key book and oops, that was accidentally put in there. No, dude, that's like <laughs> excuse my French. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I apologize, but it's just like that. And those are things that those are exciting things to do as comic collectors. So I see exactly what your point. Those dollar yeah. bin digs. It's something that sometimes is hard on the comic shop if they over order, mm-hmm. but the fans like they make memories that bond you to that store for years, and so. It's a very good point, too, even though I somehow may not always think it's the best thing for the industry to clear out stock at like 66 to 75 percent, even almost taking a loss on it from what you sell as a retailer. Mm-hmm. 
but it's, it's something that is a necessary, you know, thing to have to do at times. Yeah. And it's, uh, I just don't think it's something that should be a huge norm for you to have to get rid of the stock you paid a good amount for yeah. to have on your stands. And part of that I do feel is like the oversaturation of variants, mm-hmm. making people trade out covers because as a subscription, we have subscriptions too. Yeah. And we, everybody usually wants the regular cover. Yeah, I do. But, I do too. That's what I've been buying. Yeah. And then sometimes there are people that go out there and they say, oh, okay, wow, dude, this other option cover is cool. I'm going to trade out my regular cover for this cover. Mm. Well, that's just a wash to us. Yeah. Because they're technically, do you know what I mean? They're not buying both. Mm-hmm. They're just putting back one and picking the other. Yeah. And so uh, then I have to hope that someone else is going to want that regular mm-hmm. cover. And it's just kind of their saturation levels that especially in markets where there's multiple comic shops, you have a window about seven days to sell that comic at its highest level. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't, then it's kind of the odds are the diehard collectors already got that book. And so it's, I almost say too, the variants are great for options, but it is a challenge for a comic shop to decide what is worth having a good amount of and what's not worth Mm -hmm. having a good amount of. That's fantastic insight. I mean, there's essentially what this comes down to. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of different sides to this, you know, but we are, we're coming off of the, the last day of celebration here while we're recording this. And wow, there was, there was so much good content coming out of that. Dude, I want to go to a Star Wars celebration so bad. They just announced 2020. Are we going? Where's that? Anaheim. Oh yes, dude. Absolutely. We're going. Dude. All right. You guys heard it here. Yes, dude. What the? Man. Eric and I just talked about we oh we're, we have our hearts set on going now. Oh, yeah. What's Anaheim. it going to be? Same time next year in April? Yeah, pro- they didn't announce a date, but uh, Anaheim 2020. Oh so my gosh, that'll be epic. Is, at the convention and, center too. I don't know. I guess I guess we'll see. I don't know if or they specified Disneyland. where. I don't know. I uh, where could they hold it in Disneyland? I mean, uh, I would hope that I guess the Anaheim Convention Center then on that. Then. Yeah, you can always go to Disneyland as well. Dude, because Star Wars <laughs> Land will be open by then too. That's true. That'll That's be my true. first trip to Star Wars land then in that oh. aspect of things. That's going to be unbelievable. You're making this trip expensive. I know. That's the thing, too. It's like, gosh, man, it's got to be worth every penny if I get all the Star Wars information that we need. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God, because the movies will be tied up by then, and it's just going to be all what's expanded from here. Speaking of tied up, how about that episode nine trailer? Oh, my gosh, dude. I thought it was awesome. I yep. said, too, one of my favorite scenes just from the start is watching Ray, and he's got to be Kylo Ren's. It has to be. Out. And I, you know, I didn't even realize that they didn't show Kylo Ren. Well, the show I, was his hands. Well, I thought it was his hands too, but then what I, was that? I thought, I, I agree okay. that it's Kylo Ren. Yeah. Um, but I, I didn't realize that they didn't show his face. Yes. That was kind of cool. Cause all it was, was the hands gripping. I was thinking at first, was that Vader? I'm going, that's gotta be Kylo. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I, I mean? And then I saw the ship again. So I had to watch the, mm-hmm. the trailer like two to three times to absorb everything going mm-hmm. on in there. But then watching her hop over oh. or look, getting ready to hop over mm-hmm. and then they cut scene. I'm going, Oh, this is going to be so awesome. And obviously the, the Skywalker lightsaber lives. Yes. And she, uh, like, I was surprised they revealed that so fast. I know. Cause that's the thing too. It was supposedly destroyed in the last movie. Mm-hmm. Wasn't it? Well, so it looked like the top half, um, was mostly intact. Um, I think it looked like she rebuilt the bottom half. Okay. And the middle, the middle and the bottom half. So it must be the same kyber crystal and she salvaged uh, what what she could. Um, but I didn't realize they didn't show Kylo Ren's face in that scene until I saw a description of it, like of what we assume is Kylo Ren. Like, oh, and I watched it again. Like, oh, we don't actually see it. Maybe yes. they're trying to hide what his face looks like at this point in the movie. Yes, that's another thing too. Is like there are some a couple screenshots that like they're, analyzing on some of the other post video people things mm-hmm. that people put together to analyze their uh, what they saw in the in the trailer and if someone did mention that like if you notice like it looks like uh adam driver's face or kylo ren's face has got more scarring to it it seemed like it i mean it was kind of hard uh, to, tell. to tell but like i definitely picked up on that as well yes and it's like they're the whole thing too of him rebuilding the mask too because mm-hmm. people are saying like maybe this will be the the movie of his redemption but I kind of don't get that feeling. I disagree. I think yeah. that had to have already have happened. Yes, it's. I think he's he's sliding more and more into the Vader persona than he is into anything. I mean, I mean, people argue like he didn't he didn't have the heart to to kill um, his mother. Yes. Um, but he still he still killed Snoke. He still killed Han Solo. Like, how do you go from killing your father to un- the he's, only way I'd be okay with it is if it was like a Darth Vader thing. I think at the end where it's like it's just a last sacrifice, but. I, I think it has to be contingent that he has to die for it to work. 
That's true. Like yeah. he has to give up his life in order for it to be redemption. I see. So that's like, that's it. It's like that he did something good in dying more or less. Than I, I think so. I, I think it'd be more like Vader to Luke type of thing. Yeah. The Return of the Jedi. And now is that repetitive? You know, yeah. is it, is it more interesting perhaps? So this is called Rise of Skywalker, right? Right. Right. Did I get that right? Yeah, Rise of the Skywalkers. So obviously um, we know Kylo Ren's, um, lineage but i feel like it it more also kind of reveals that that ray obviously it's has something Skywalker to do with too, it possibly yeah. yeah i mean my my personal theory is that she, she is uh kylo's sister they were they were twins and i think leia hid her from han and everybody same thing like padme did to like hide luke exactly hid ray exactly so i think i think leia had some kind of foresight and just in case, you know, just felt this need, you know, maybe it'll be explained uh, in the movie. But we did see that shot of Carrie Fisher yes, and Ray hugging Ray. and the tears. Yeah, I, I got I got honestly like I, I got choked up when I when I saw that. Part. I was going to say I'm going, <laughs> man, because I said, too, we all know Carrie Fisher's past. Yeah. It's like it was like kind of that was the nod to all the fans of like that. Hey, it's going to be OK. I think I think it's her mother. Like, uh, yeah. That's, what do you think? I, after seeing that moment, I kind of see that more or less. I do like the theory of the twins being separated because that does Star Wars likes to shadow themselves yeah. over and over and over again, which is great because it is, it's a lineage. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's like started off with Anakin and Padme and then obviously Luke and Leia. And if you have twins, I think you keep, it's, you have to be a twin. You genetically keep having twins. I believe it yeah, works it's like supposed that. to skip a generation, but it doesn't have to. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I could see too, it's like, yeah, it's like, it's the force. They can do whatever the heck they want. That's Forget right. generations. That's <laughs> you right. You know what I mean? Well, but, uh, so because it's Rise of Skywalker, if Rey is on the good side and um, Kylo is on the dark side, I think it'd be very interesting if they they start the the next generation of Sith and Jedi respectively. That, I could see that too. You and know? I do even like thinking about the fact too to more strengthen your theory about the twins being separated was that Luke took on the responsibility of trying to teach Kylo and he mm. failed. And mm. so they hid Rey... I think as kind of just in case we need the contingency plan. We don't want two of them to fail. Yeah. And so we need to keep one hiding because if Kylo knows about the other one, he'll try corrupting her. So too. she had the foresight to, yeah, like to Leia do that. Kind of separated the same thing too. Like Luke and Leia were separated. It's like, the, okay, we need to repeat history because we do have this dangerous thing of me and Han having twins. You know, it's like Luke, oh, I'll, I'll take on the responsibility of training Kylo, mm -hmm. but we need to keep Ray as a backup plan just in case, you know, it's the Obi-Wan and Vader thing with my, with my father. Yeah. And almost her, like her where father Luke was on the dark side. That's why he didn't even want to tell Ray that type of stuff too, because you know, it's like that. I can't have that risk of feeling like that. They, she was lied to. Yeah. Because that's kind of where Luke and Leia, do you know what I mean? Type of yeah. feel like Luke's like got pissed at Vader, his dad for telling him like that. It can't be true. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It almost drove Luke to the dark side in Return of the Jedi. Well, in that one shot, they were both crying. So I mean, that might yes. be a lot to take in. Like, oh my gosh, Ray is Ray's my mother. Yeah, and we all know J.J. Uh, Abrams said like they were able to to salvage footage, unused footage from uh, Episode Seven. Mm -hmm. So maybe this was meant to be revealed, but because of a rewrite, um, they didn't reveal Ray's parentage. So maybe they had filmed it this they way. Had it ready. You know, but like, how crazy would that be? I think it's going to ask that too. I think there's going to be so much good because it's supposed to connect everything together. This is number nine. You can't okay. really leave the loose ends out there. And this, since this is connecting everything together, there was the, the biggest reveal from that trailer oh was gosh. the return of Palpatine. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, was un, I was uncertain at first. And yes. then as if you're watching the live panel, um, they cut to Ian McDermott on, on stage who plays uh, Palpatine. He says, roll it again in his, yes, in his uh, emperor voice. Uh, but man, well, having Palpatine return, like he's been the overarching villain you yes. know, pulling the strings in this whole time. Like, well, you never saw him die. I mean, it's weird. Return of the Jedi. If he's absolutely. like a major force thing, he just got thrown down. The, I've seen people you upset. Seen explode. You yep. didn't see him chop right. in half. You're you didn't see anything right. except the fact that maybe stormtroopers caught him and walked him off. <laughs> Who knows? Do you know what I mean? Well, <laughs> I'm just saying, like, just so, craziness. Well, the, the Imperial Death, Guard. The Death like, Star did right. blow up. Yeah, that's true. I see. I see Did how people. Did you see the big scene think, of the Death Star kind of floating out there? Oh, that no, it was the the, 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 the um, Death Star. Yeah, yeah, it was landed. Yeah, that was totally the Death Star. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think I think people just want to find a reason to be upset, and it's oh, easy dude. to say Palpatine returning is stupid, but it's not. We oh. spent Episode Three 
um, learning the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise, how he was able to manipulate the midi-chlorians to create life. And yes. the, half of that movie and, and Anakin's fall to the dark side was trying to learn this power that, that Palpatine had learned from Plagueis, which he was probably just hiding from from Vader, so Vader doesn't kill him. Well, you even know. going back to Revenge of the Sith, if you don't quite, you know, I don't know if people have been touched on this, but uh, when Obi-Wan left, he thought he, Anakin was dead. Mm-hmm. And then sure enough, dude, the Imperial's Emperor shuttle showed up to bring Vader back to life. Yeah. So I said, too, it's like the Empire's so well connected, it, you know, the disturbance in the Force, who knows who else was being maybe trained just in case I'm sure Palpatine might have known that Vader was at risk of Luke. Let's have another Sith in the waiting to maybe be there. It's like, who's going to be? Well, my that's next what I, that's, that's what I think Snoke is. Also, now Snoke Pal- is the guy that was maybe there that rescued Palpatine in the first place, possibly then. Interesting. Well, if we, if we look into some of the older uh, novels that take place after Return of the Jedi that are no longer canon, um, Palpatine came back in the, the novels That's when the whole cool, thing was like right? marriage. And yes, Palpatine cloned himself and transferred his consciousness. So I personally feel there's, they're going to either draw from, from the cloning thing and maybe do something with referencing back to those midi chlorians and maybe kind of do some combination thing. But, but that ties the prequels back into the, to this new sequel trilogy. If yes. they, like how powerful is well, the attack Palpatine? of the clones? Yeah. He did the order for the clones, right? Or was it Dooku that um, did the order? So Pal- Palpatine was pulling the strings in the background, from what I understand. But uh, it was Sifo Dyas who was Dooku, who placed. Right? Uh, no, it's uh, oh, Dooku's. Okay. Uh, he he hung out with Dooku. I, I don't know if he trained Dooku. No, Yoda trained Dooku. Uh, he was just a, he was a different Jedi. Um, I okay. think and ultimately oh, got killed. Um, I think there's actually a novel coming out in a few weeks. Um, that's going to explain this in more detail. So that's going to be really and if, interesting. And if Boba Fett or Jango Fett can order clones of himself. Why don't you think Palpatine would order clones of himself? Palpatine too? didn't trust the clones and shut down the the clones um, shortly after he took over. Okay. So it's oh, interesting that's right. He's that with the stormtroopers then. Yes. Yeah, so, so we switched over to stormtroopers. So it'd be interesting if he just kind of kept cloning for himself. So there's, I don't know. I think the truth might be somewhere in looking into the old extended universe stuff and something with the way he's able to manipulate midi chlorians to create life. Because the, one of the recent Darth Vader comics, I think uh, Vader has a dream um, where it reveals that that Palpatine manipulated the force to create him. So yes. why can't he have a contingency plan to, to come okay. back from this? I think it just shows how powerful Palpatine he really is. is. But I mean, he's, he is that conniving and we saw that, you know, in the movies in the, in the clone wars uh, uh, show. So I, I think it totally makes sense and it's exciting and, I, and I'm excited to see um, what they're going to do with this. Now is technically would Palpatine be the first Skywalker then? I see what you're saying. Do you know what I mean? He's like the big reveals because Shimmy was a Skywalker, obviously. But if Palpatine was the one that created the life of Anakin, so the, the, the he, argument he created the Skywalker lineage himself. And that's why he's always wanted to control it the whole time, no matter who it is, because he knows that he's the one that he gave perpetuated life, this. So he should be able to control it in his mind. So, so it's even more poetic that I think he's in it. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's really exciting. You know, JJ Abrams, you know, loves star Wars. And I was reading that he actually consulted George Lucas on, on the script and, and the, the, the whole uh, concept of, of bringing Palpatine back. So, I mean, I, I think we're going to get a really good ending. That would uh, make really sense with the whole thing too. It's like everyone said, well, maybe raise a Palpatine. And I'm I've heard well, people that, say that. that would make sense if Palpatine created the Skywalker lineage. Do you mean she technically is a Palpatine in a weird way of saying it? Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if she, if she turns out to have anything to do with Luke or Leia, um, yeah, she, that's, that's absolutely true. Pretty deep. So what do you think about Snoke then now based on this little bit of footage? Cause I, I know I'd already said like, I, I think Snoke was either a puppet of Palpatine this whole time or he was a failed clone of Palpatine. So that's oh. why he's kind of messed up looking. That's why he's got the, the you know, I face. don't know, just, just a thought. And now that'll, that'll make Snoke a little more interesting. Cause you know, we have no story. of. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would almost say too, is like Snoke disappointed Palpatine or Snoke tried to overthrow Palpatine and Palpatine threw the electricity at his face. Yeah. And that's what may have scarred his face. You'll I could see the see big that. reveal on that too. It's like that he tried more or less overthrowing Palpatine. And he's going, no, you fail. But now I get to be in hiding again because people still don't know that I exist still. So you are going to be my puppet this whole time. 
I think they'll reveal what the deal with Snoke is, and I'll be very surprised if it has nothing to do with Palpatine at all. Oh, I think it is a huge thing with Palpatine, too. Yeah. Yes, I think that's going to be fun to see that everything gets revealed. And mm-hmm. I, is it going to be Kylo that does the revelations type of thing, too, to, like, you know, more or less one last-ditch effort to try to get Rey to rejoin his mm-hmm. side? Is it going to be, like, you know, Kylo Palpatine revealing himself to Kylo and... I was like, you killed my father, my grandfather <laughs> type of thing. Or do you know what's what's that's the two? I still think as the two Kylo's going to be, as you said, too, maybe redeemed in death. Mm-hmm. But they have to does kind of echo the, the previous things. Obviously, you know, Vader and Luke had their moment. Is it going to be Kylo and Ray with Palpatine trying to pull the strings, hoping that Ray will be coming to his side? And then Kylo, once again, is the final demise of Palpatine yeah. type of thing like they did with Return of the Jedi or is that way too predictable? Is it? Yeah. I mean, cause here's my, my argument on, on Kylo potentially starting like the new generation of Sith and perhaps getting rid of the rule of two that Darth, I think Darth Bane who started that and, and Ray ushering in um, the, the next generation of Jedi is in the, in the, in the original prequels, uh, Anakin was supposed to bring balance to the force, you yes. know? So, is the force in balance when there's two Sith and thousands of Jedi. So if we got brought down to a handful of both, but now it would, I would argue it's balanced if there's a ton of Jedi and a ton of Sith. That okay. isn't that what balances. And is, the, are the Sith still in play or are they like the Knights of Ren now? I, because was like Vader, the end of the Sith. And now they had to go try to find a new dark practice. And so they, they converted to the Knights of Ren, and that's I, why it's Kylo Ren type of thing? Or am I missing something on that? Yeah, I don't, I, I, not, I don't know if too many details have really been revealed about the Knights of Ren. I think they're going to do more with them in this movie, if I'm not okay. mistaken. Because that's going to be sick, too, to see more Knights of Ren. I was under the impression they were more like Inquisitors, okay. kind of kind of like how Darth Vader or, and or Palpatine had Inquisitors. Um, but, I mean, Kylo's... So the Sith no, are still in play, then? Possibly. I mean, they're everywhere. people keep saying that uh, Snoke isn't a Sith... Um, but I mean like their, their dark side. Uh-huh. Um, I feel like it's their, cause it's from Darth Bane, Bane and we had all these Darths and like, that was kind of, I don't know, I almost call it like their sub cult, but if it's Kylo Ren and the Knights of Ren, like being this Ren is almost like, like a moniker, like I Darth see. used to be. That's, yeah, that's how I'm, like I'm taking sick. it. Yeah. It's still dark, I, dark practice of the force. I think these are going to be answered in, in episode nine. Yeah. So I said too, it's going to be kind of, but they got to be laying the groundwork for what's next because mm-hmm. they, I don't know how true this is or not. I might be speculating too much too, but I thought over that I read somewhere over the years that once nine finishes, mm-hmm. it's supposed to lead to the next steps of the universe. And that may be a TV series that maybe whatever else is going after the, the, it's probably all of those things, you know, it's, I, especially, especially if this ushers in the next generation of Jedi and Sith. Yes. Um, just go a few years down the road and now they're, they're new legends, Mm -hmm. you know, and you don't have to include them. You can do any kind of Jedi, any kind of Sith story. And like it, it just, it just opens up so many more possibilities. Yes, and it's just as long as the the canon's there for yep. them to explore. And yep. I hope that's what this does at the end. It's like that dude here, here's everything unwound for you. Go have fun from yep. here. It's like this is what the, th- the nine movies were mm-hmm. to set up a universe for you guys to play in the sandbox. I whether think it's so. J.J. Yep. Abrams, whether it's George Lucas, whether it's James Gunn. And you have a, and you, have, like a you have a whole universe. Yeah, and you have a whole universe to play in the sandbox. Yeah. With kind of like why Disney bought Marvels. Like, they, hey, they wanted to expand on the potential mm-hmm. of what the Marvel universe can do and we've seen that with all the movies that have come out since yeah. iron man yeah. star wars is going to get that same thing through disney Absolutely. it's like that here's the, the you know the groundwork go have fun and that's what this last movie is supposed to be that final piece of laying that out for so much more cool new star wars stuff down the line yeah and i i know the disney the new disney stuff gets a lot of flack but i mean like i've i've really enjoyed most of it oh, me i mean too. not everything but yeah. like a lot of the old extended, I'm going to get a lot of hate for saying this. A lot of the old extended universe stuff, like got so out of control. Like mm-hmm. the, the power is perpetuated and perpetuated. And like, like where do you go when you're like destroy a planet with a force? You, yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> you know? It's like, you're like Galactus all by yourself. But there was a lot of great stuff. Like I'll, I miss, you know, I'm, I'm upset that like Mara Jade isn't canon, but like yeah. they're, they're bringing back great characters like Thrawn and they're doing it like in a very respectful way. Like I yes. love Thrawn and all of the, the novels, the new novels have been fantastic. 
Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And There's a whole galaxy out there. And that's what I love exactly. too. Every planet's got their own species. They got their own politics. They have their own connection. A lot of the new too. novels have, have touched on all different reaches of space and like, it, yes, and it all works, you know, and it, and it just, you know, it feels right. You yes. Know? Um, speaking of, um, extended universe and all these other things like they showed new footage of of the mandalorian oh tv gosh, show dude. and i'm so glad it's not boba fett it's yes. cool that it, it could be boba fett but i love the fact like let's make the mandalorian legend that much more in depth now because jango was, fett was one mandalorian yes. and there's a whole community of mandalorian soldiers if our mm. bounty like some of them became bounty hunters obviously but i don't think all yeah, were bounty no they're hunters. not i mean and, yeah. and rebels and the clone wars showed that you know and all the all the struggles that mandalore had um like they're they're not just bounty hunters like they're more they're a race of people i mean they're they're warrior people that's, that's why they can be uh Good great, bounty great bounty hunters obviously um but they're they're warrior people yes you know? and they've they've had their share of oppression and you know, then Darth Maul comes and takes over. And now we're finally going to see how that comes to a close with season seven of Clone Wars. Yes. You know, that's what I can't wait to see, too, is like that. So is that where the story was going from the Han Solo movie back into the cartoon of the Clone Wars? So or the so that takes place afterward. So what season seven has to do is show how th- him kind of taking over Mandalore ends and how he gets over there to the uh, it was it called the Crimson Dawn. OK, Um. so. He got there somehow. So he's not on Mandalore, but he, he went over to this gang now. Yes. So I think now that we have that, you know, Dave Filoni is really smart. I mean, like, or I think we're going to get that little bridge gap bridge there. Okay. You so know, at least the reference to, I hope then, or is that going to be, so I thought it would be great to have another trilogy within the trilogy, the Han Solo trilogy. Cause like the first one be Han Solo, the second one be Lando and the third one be Boba Fett. Interesting. I, and it kind of connects the stories that lead into Empire Strikes Back. I thought that would be really cool too. I can't believe you said that. Uh-huh. Um, my only difference was would somebody else be like the second one? So like a sub trilogy that would arch over to be like Darth Maul being this villain. But it's a shame that you know Rebels already had that that final battle with with Darth Maul and Obi Wan. So like, but like, do you do that again? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, Han Solo, Boba Fett, and uh, an Obi Wan movie. That would be cool have everything lead up because i said too there's so many little stories in between the stories mm-hmm. that's what's great about the comics yes if the comics are filling in all of those gap mm-hmm. stories that and happen the novels between too. yeah the novels too mm-hmm. as well like a new hope empire strikes back you know return of the jedi even between um <clears throat> sorry dude attack of the clones and the first uh phantom menace attack the clones and revenge of the sith mm-hmm. and then oh my gosh dude i'm forgetting the name of the previous two movies now before um, oh, you're talking about Force Awakens and Last yeah, Jedi? Yeah, Force Awakens, Last Jedi. Thank mm. you, dude. So going, oh, my gosh. I'm, my, my Geritol moment just kicked in there. <laughs> you know, the nine names of the movies. And, but, uh, yeah, it's like it's great to see that how the books and the comics are. There was gaps in between each movie. There's usually about a three to five year gap between mm-hmm. each movie. Yep. And that's cool to see all those adventures finally being laid out to fill in all those gaps it's like just endless and endless and endless material that yeah especially the, the star wars there. comics you know bridging you know uh empire strikes back and all that like there the are vader there are stories huge, yes that first star wars yep. arc that jason aaron did and like just the him realizing that luke could be his son yes I, I read those great panels yeah. mm-hmm. and it's like that oh it's like because this- it was boba fett right who who was looking for him and that was that was what put in his mind is like i just got a name it was skywalker right yes. wasn't that what it was yeah and then vader's all a skywalker oh it's like that he remembers who he is uh-huh. nobody else may know who he is but yeah. you know he knows who he is and it's like oh my gosh that started laying the groundwork for the fact of him possibly overthrowing palpatine to him and his son rule the galaxy together like he hoped i've been i've been reading a lot of the the recent novels and in my readings um thrawn has suspected who he is Really? Nice. Which was interesting because they met um, in the Clone Wars era. And in the Tarkin novel, he kind of threw out that idea as well. Tarkin may have been in fear of like that if he does reveal it, that Vader will just take him out. Or the fact of like maybe because Tarkin was one of the guys that felt like he could still overthrow Vader at certain points. Tarkin too, right? wasn't scared of Vader. Yeah, it was like that. He's one of the few people that. But they had a sort of, I think the novel um, kind of explains how they kind of read those novels on that then. at the end they kind of get a mutual respect uh, okay. for each other because uh vader finds out that he used to be like this warrior and like the the tarkins used to do crazy stuff back on their their planet oh, uh, yeah That's it is a very good novel uh, the author's name is uh james um 
I, I it's it's slipping my mind right now, but like it was, it was very well written, very interesting. Uh, it's Definitely almost like checking out. Had a contingency plan if they'd ever turned on him that Tarkin could be there. Well, as I mean, even like okay, an enforcer. Or well, no? I mean, he's. I think he was too old at that point. But I mean, okay. like just that he used. He was like a battle hardened veteran. I think was the the respect because Tarkin met Anakin in uh, in the Clone Wars show. Um, okay, Anakin had rescued him uh, in Ahsoka, and uh, I think uh, Tarkin was getting on Ahsoka's nerves. <laughs> nice. Did you catch the um, the the Clone Wars trailer? The, the season seven trailer that was shown at a celebration. I have not. No. In my in my personal opinion, it didn't really show too much. Um, but I mean, it was just exciting. I mean, the most interesting thing was you know Darth Maul says something at the end. You're like you're not Kenobi, like something along those lines. Uh, but I I just feel like we're finally gonna get closure on on a lot of the older uh, storylines. So I need to sit down and just binge watch all the Clone War cartoons. Yeah. That's going to take some time, I imagine. But aren't they usually like 15 minutes a piece? Or are they, did those, are they the 30 minutes now again? They're, yeah, or they were, minutes, yeah, whatever. I think they were roughly 20. Uh, I'll be honest, like, I, I know I'm in the, the, the unpopular opinion. I liked Rebels more than Clone Wars. Okay. Um, Clone Wars is, is fantastic, though. Uh, my, my only complaint was there was a lot of filler episodes, especially when you have like a three episode arc following Jar Jar Binks. Like, I don't oh, understand, nice. like, why that happened. Like, it, it gets really boring at times, but like, the, the good stuff like really makes it worth it. Okay, so I'll have to like binge watch so Rebels and then Clone Wars. Then? No, Cl- Clone Wars then Rebels. Clone Wars and, and Rebels. Okay. And, you know, I did it backwards. I I fell in love with Rebels first, and then I went back and watched all the Clone Wars. And I did not realize how often Rebels referenced like Clone little Wars, things really? in the Clone Wars. And like when I was watching, I was like, oh, that was in Rebels. But I mean, like I had it backwards. You know, because Clone Wars did it first. So I, there's there's a lot of really neat things that that tie in that you don't even realize if you're watching one uh, or the other. That's epic. That's still Netflix, right? I think they just pulled it down oh. a few days ago. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. You okay. might have to wait till Disney Plus. Yes. I think that's something I'm going to have to invest in Disney I mean, Plus. For, I think it was six ninety nine. dollars I, I think that's totally worth it. Yes, that's even cheaper than the D- DC one. Isn't the DC one, weren't they like nine ninety? dollars I, th- I wanted to say that's what it was. And yeah, absolutely. $12.99 I mean, or whatever it was even. Disney got that price point right. I mean, I was I was ready for $8.99, $9.99. Um, especially it was including the, the backlog of, of the Disney Vault movies and what I would love to see, and I don't think they talked about this yet, I hope that they put the old Marvel cartoons on there, like Dude, the 90s, 90s X-Men and yes. Spider-Man. Like, I love the that Silver stuff. Surfer, the Iron the Man Silver cartoon. Surfer, I remember <laughs> yes, those. Yes, dude, Fantastic Four had a cartoon. Everybody had a cartoon. And I think even Force Works had a cartoon for a short period Force of time. Force Works? I don't even, I'm not even yeah, aware of that. that was like the that. replacement for West Coast one. Avengers back in the 90s. They called it Force Works. And it was kind of, uh, West Coast Avengers got canceled and they decided to start a book called Force Works. And it okay. was like War Machine and Spider Woman. Um, let me see who else was in that team. Oh, gosh, dude. It was a pretty bad experiment, unfortunately. But yeah. I think they wanted it for the cartoon reasons. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, it was pretty cool cart- a pretty cool comic for a little bit, but it didn't go quite as well as they hoped it would. I think it was just during the 90s, they threw everything at the wall to try to compete yeah. with Image. Well, yeah. the, there was a, there was so much good content. Like the the old '90s X Men like followed so many awesome storylines yes. from the comics. Oh, dude, that was like Scott Lobdell to a T. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was insane about how well like a lot of Scott Lobdell's stories got adapted mm-hmm. in the cartoon, but then the Chris Claremont John Byrne yes. stuff was unbelievable. We had I thought a they did better with that than they did with Spider Man cartoons. They did yeah. their own continuity. It seemed mm-hmm. like a lot of times. Yeah. But with the X-Men, they took that almost off the page yep. and made it into cartoons. I mean, obviously, Morph was a character they created just for the cartoon. I didn't even but, realize that. Yeah, Morph was one of those guys that the, I think what they were trying to do was uh, make a play off of the Mimic, but they didn't want the Mimic to look too goofy looking. Interesting. So they made Morph more of like a Mystique type of character where mm-hmm. he can morph into whatever. Even though they had to. Mystique. Yeah, exactly. But she was a villain. So they kind of the weird thing, too, is they killed him off in the first episode. Did they? Yeah, or kind of. They thought he died and because I remember he came back as yeah, a villain too. Yes, that's mm-hmm. right. And so that was kind of interesting type of thing too. Is like that they uh, they created him and then got rid of him, but then brought him back as a villain because probably fans thought that's a cool character. We'll make him the bad guy. Maybe they really initially thought they were gonna do their own thing and make stuff up, but then like no, we just we got all these scripts right here. Like let's just it's stick easy. to the comics. Yes. You know? Because he came back for like, what was it, something with Mr. Sinister, I think, right? Oh, Which that's led right. into Mr. Apocalypse. Sinister, yes. 
All that stuff was so good. Oh, man. The, the Savage Land episodes where Magneto took the Brotherhood of Evil into the Savage Land. Professor yes. X and Magneto were trapped together trying to be allies to survive the Savage Land. And, they showed, uh, and they showed flashbacks of uh, Rogue getting her super strength from holding on to Carol Danvers yes. for too long, which I hope we get in the MCU oh, soon. Dude, that, I can't. I'm so glad that's done. You know that the whole Marvel and Fox thing is finally I know. done. Yes, and I don't. It was know like a dream come true. It. Oh, I man, I can't wait to see where they go with this. Yeah. I I still keep on hoping they're going to do something in Avengers, but I think it's too late for them to already yeah, add and anything else. You know, and it. that's unfortunate. But we've had a great run with Avengers, and now Marvel needs some things to focus on. And I think there's a few things. There's now they're going to have mutants in a few years, yes. hopefully. So mutants, X Men. So they have those stories. Um, obviously we have Spider-Man back and we still have a little more to explore Spider-Man, but we have Fantastic Four, yep. which is going to be pretty cool. But on the other side of all this too, I think it would be very interesting to, to contrast with this because in the, the past MCU week, we've had contrasting kinds of movies with like, sure, there's all the Avengers stuff, but then we're over here with Guardians of the Galaxy. If we're sitting here focusing on Spider-Man and X-Men and all these really classic things, I think it'd be really cool to have this kind of dark underground that will later tie in exactly so blade ghost rider that lead up to maybe like a little midnight suns event where they fight morbius or or no morbius joined them mephisto that's even better that would be unbelievable because that would be oh my gosh dude the midnight suns would be is that too mephisto being a villain that they could more or less if they want to bring him into the rest of the marvel universe but it's the midnight suns that found out they could not defeat him and then they got to go more or less share with the rest of the marvel universe that sure Mephisto's out there and he's uh, he's ready to take over type of thing. Almost like with Dormammu, he had to deal with Doctor Strange. I, I And I'd even be okay with Mephisto being a puppet to, you know, so, some, some bigger bad guy. Because I, you know, Marvel got the rights back to Ghost Rider, um, you know, years ago. And in the first Avengers movie when, or no, not the first Avengers movie. Um, what movie was it when the... The Guardians of the Galaxy, when Ronan kills the um, the Oracle Chachari guy. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, the, oh, don't talk to Thanos. You know, he breaks his neck, you yes. know. I thought they killed him off because they were going to bring him Mephisto into that role. Oh, no and way. And that never happened. <clears throat> that would have been awesome. You know, because in the Infinity Gauntlet story, he, Mephisto's hanging out with Thanos. Yes. And we never got, I thought for sure that, that was what was going to happen. That would have been great. Because why did they kill the Chitari guy? Because he was like his right hand man and they never replaced him. With anybody. Well, I guess they had Ebony Ma, right? Yeah. So I guess that's the the closest thing to Mephisto because he was like a priestess type of thing, right? I but, guess how do you explain where Mephisto came from? Yeah. You know, just out of enough. nowhere. It's like that, oh, Thanos has been teaming with this demon this whole time to create all this chaos. I guess it was, Maybe, it was but, a, it's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, and I think they, they they did a pretty good job with how they laid everything out of like that doing something where the comic fans can appreciate what's happening in there, and then the moviegoers won't feel like what I'm confused about what's happening here. You know, ten years ago, or yeah, ten, maybe eleven, twelve years ago, I never th- would have thought we would have ever have gotten a, an Infinity Gauntlet movie. Dude, that's insane. You know, and I that know. was always my favorite. You know, co- comic arc um, from the from the comics. Um, so it's what a time for, for Marvel movies, you know, exactly. what a time to be a comic book fan. Oh man. As that too, that ties up everything right there is like that. We're in this era where everything we read as kids is coming to life. So cool. And it's a uh, set too. I can't, I literally cannot wait to see how they, they move forward with X-Men and fantastic four and the midnight Suns, And it's just that Disney app there too. I mean, with the Netflix shows being canceled, I was a little bit crushed about that. They're coming back they're on that. Coming Absolutely. back on that. Absolutely. And it's just like, everybody they're picking is there's 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 no misses yet mm-hmm. i mean of any of the characters can you say like that oh there's no way that guy should be the punisher or there's no way that guy should be daredevil or there's no way that guy should be ghost rider Dare, Even in daredevil the, 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 the shield and, show. yeah daredevil and punisher were exceptional um yes. jessica jones was a little slow for me but it really picked up in season two luke cage i think is the one that's just been kind of whatever but it's been fine. Yes. I thought the actors that they picked were good actors though, for those characters. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the Danny Rand Iron Fist is the only guy I haven't liked so far. Oh, that's right. Oh my gosh. I totally forgot. Yeah. And then he's just, I guess I don't, I'm just not a huge Iron Fist fan maybe. But I'm not either, kind of, but like he's very underwhelming. Yeah. Uh, and it, for someone that's supposed to be more or less like a Bruce Wayne type of character mm-hmm. in the Marvel universe, because Rand Industries is technically like Wayne Industries. You know, in, in Iron Fist, I found, um, the whole that lawyer much more interesting uh Hor- horgoth i'm gonna i know i'm pronouncing that wrong you know you know what i'm talking about the lawyer inside the iron fist show 
Well, she was oh, the lawyer the, in like all of the oh, shows, yeah, yes. okay, but she yes, was. Yes, in the Iron Fist. But she one, developed so Jones. much. She developed so much further in Iron Fist, and then in Jessica Jones. Yes, yeah, it's like that, and it's that too. She was, yeah, too. She was probably one of the best actresses in that. That yeah, she's show. fantastic. Actually, I, just, I didn't even realize until watching a few of those episodes that she was uh, Trinity in the in the Matrix. I didn't realize that's who oh, the that's actress who was. The actress was. Yeah. That's why she looked familiar. I'm going, yes, oh, okay. I see. I didn't realize yeah, that either. Why she seemed so familiar to me. It's like no way, dude, because her hair's all white now, and mm-hmm. it was a uh, no. She has. Did she have still dark hair? It was dark. It was darker. Dark, but it was short. Yeah. It was shorter. shorter. That's what difference on it there too. It was going. Yeah, I'm going. It was just she was she was she was a pretty badass character. And I said, too, having her cross over into the other TV shows was kind of always fun to see her be that constant power attorney. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I said, too, it was like that. I kept on wondering. It's like that. Does she have like she's a fetish with Jessica, obviously, in the Jessica mm-hmm. Jones series. And that mixed scene with uh, I was I want to say like that was an obviously in Luke Cage, too. Didn't she make a cameo in Luke Cage, too, or no? I don't remember. Yeah, I'm trying to remember like all the different shows she crossed over into. I th- I, she might have been like, I. I really liked the beginning of Luke Cage, but after they killed off, um, I think it was Cottonmouth, um, it, it really lost its its pace for me. Like yeah. Diamondback was just not as interesting. And then in the second series season, I mean, I thought the the sister, the one that took over after mm-hmm. Cottonmouth was killed, dude, she got so so dark as the series went. Did she? I'm still like oh halfway gosh, through it. <laughs> She's pure evil. I've never seen a character. Interesting as evil I remember as she was messing with her daughter and oh, stuff. Oh yes, yeah. dude. And that's like kind of I said too some of the things that she said to her daughter at the end of Interesting. of this series were going, Are you kidding me, dude? No, you I'll like, be done with it soon. Oof, man, you were like you're 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 an evil piece of work. I accidentally started the Punisher season two. But Punisher's so good too. Yeah. I, I mean, know. I'm excited to finish it. Man, dude. Yeah, John Barenthal, I think is like I was I was thinking Shane when I first like, oh man, Shane is a Punisher, but he just hits He's fantastic. An aspect of Frank Castle. I think the comics have never even hit on and before. it's and it's Almost unfortunate, like how much he upstaged the Daredevil in uh, season two. Oh, absolutely! Uh, of dude. Daredevil, he yeah, Charlie he Cox stole is good, the but show. He's Charlie so Cox good. is phenomenal. Wait, but that monologue oh. with the the one batch, two batch, so like ugh, unbelievable. He, John Bernthal is is so unbelievably talented. Um, it's going to be interesting watching his career from there. I hope so, and I hope he's not done being the Punisher. I really hope that Netflix, you know, does decide to let's do some more Punisher too on this. Or not Netflix, I'm sorry, Disney. Yeah. Now I, that Netflix is done with it, I hope gone. so too. Or maybe I hope that even they'll transition to maybe some movies. Oh, dude, if they could put him into the movies with that, that I would, would be. I would love a Punisher cameo in in Spider Man. Like how cool! Throw back to the first appearance of, of yeah, the Punisher, Punisher. meeting Spider Man. Yeah, yes. I think that would be a neat. And Tom Holland and. Uh, and John Bernthal are already friends anyway. That would be That's epic. how they, they auditioned. It was together. Really? I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, no there's, there's an audition tape of uh, like they're, they're friends and like he was Spider-Man and he was the Punisher. Wow. See, that'd be epic. Gosh, <laughs> I'd love to see that. That'd just be like a fun little short just to see someone do like an animated version mm-hmm. of that script reading. Do you know what I mean, dude? That would, uh, <laughs> that would be epic. Interesting. Interesting. That's a, that's actually a pretty good idea. Yeah, it's like it's when you get an animated script that yeah. would get the animation to go over their script reading. So we're going to delve in to more of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in uh, in next week's podcast because it's going to be the week leading up to Avengers Endgame. And we're going to talk yes. about our theories and our biggest wants. Uh, but I think that's uh, just about all the time we have for today. But Ken, thank you so much for, for coming in and, and joining Nightcap Chat. And I look forward to doing to doing this with you uh, every week as, as much as we can. I'm honored to look forward to doing more down the road. We'll see you all next week. We're going to talk about uh, Avengers Endgame, and we've got some other exciting things coming up uh, down the road. Thank you all for listening, and tune in next week.